I guess it's customary to say something self-deprecating, so um, I'll pass on that. Thank you very much for coming. Um, you know, I was going to say, obviously you didn't come here to see me, but since everybody else is saying that, um, you came here for something. I don't know what it is. I guess I have the good fortune not to have heard of the Northwest Kidney Centers until recently. Um, and that's something to be thankful for, too. But um, it's really a privilege and a pleasure to be here, um, to be able to appear for such a good cause and to be able to talk to you about a subject I care greatly about, which is nutrition, health, labor, environment, animals, climate change, cooking, a couple other things, all in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, those are the big issues of our time. Nutrition, is, nutrition and diet are probably among the biggest issues that any of us face, but they're all tied together. And as we know, things are not going so well. I don't need to fill your head with a bunch of statistics about our diet, obesity, diabetes, kidney disease. Um, you know this stuff as well as I do, and the details are really not important. Fact is, tens of millions of Americans have kidney problems, 100 million or more are obese and are pre diabetic, and we're not dealing with this. So the question is at this breakfast of hope is there hope? And the answer is there probably is. Um, there are four things we need to pay attention to. I think, from my perspective, when it comes to improving diet, there are four things we need to pay attention to. One is to define food. What is food? The second is transparency. How do we know what's in our food? The third is education and regulation. How do we get people to understand what's going on? And how do we help people to eat better? And the fourth I'm going to get to. Let's just talk about what food is. Food is a substance, any substance, that provides nutrition and encourages health and growth to plants or animals or humans. Provides nutrition, encourages health and growth. Using that definition, if we say that's what food is, we can say what food is not. And the problem in the United States, one of the problems in the United States, is that we eat too much stuff that isn't food, that are food-like substances, edible food-like substances, or as we sometimes call them, unidentifiable food-like objects, UFOs. <laughs> we eat a lot of that stuff. Primarily, the biggest source of calories in the United States is sugar-sweetened beverages. We get 7% of our calories from sugar-sweetened beverages. The beverage industry would like you to think that we get only 7% of our calories from sugar-sweetened beverages, but that's like saying only 7% of deaths in the United States are from Alzheimer's disease. It's a lot. We get our second, third, and fourth most source of calories are all also hyper-processed foods that contain great amounts of sugar. Is sugar the enemy? That would be a little extreme. But added sugar in our food is a tremendous problem. The primary cause of the obesity epidemic, and as you all well know, obesity is a primary cause, cause of diabetes. When we talk about regulation and education, we have to talk about sugar and marketing junk food to children. One of the biggest problems right now is that literally billions of dollars a year are spent on selling sugary foods to kids. And the regulation, the last time a significant regulation was passed limiting the ability of marketers to ram sugar down, down kids' throats was in the 70s. Since then, there has been nothing significant. If any of you have small kids, and you've watched some of the games that they can play on computer, iPhone, iPad, anywhere, and those games are sponsored by marketers of sugar-sweetened beverages or sugary breakfast cereals, 
you're probably already in a state of shock about this. Others might have a look. I wanted to talk for a minute about transparency. How's our food produced? What do we know about where our food comes from? Very, very little. The last time our food labels were updated, and it was a good thing, was in 1993 when the FDA did side or back of package nutritional information, which can be quite useful if you're willing to take the time to read that label. But what we need now is to understand what's in our food, where it comes from, how it's produced. And we don't have much of that at all, if any. That's all about transparency. So we define food, we show people how it's made, we regulate how it's made, and we essentially try to discourage the consumption of food that's bad for us and encourage assumption, consumption of food that's good for us. This brings us to issue number four, which is something we can all share, something we can talk about with our family and friends, something we can integrate into our own lives, and that's our personal food policy. What's a personal food policy? Well, it amounts to what's our diet. Six years ago, I was 35 pounds overweight. Well, maybe 40. I had um, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, sleep apnea, bad knees, and all of that stuff seemed to sneak up on me. Although, as anyone in their, not anyone, sorry, as many people in their 50s know, if you gain a pound a year from the time you're 25 on, you just gain 30 pounds. Welcome to your 50s. So I went to a doctor friend of mine. After going to my conventional doctor who said, well, we have Lipitor, we have surgery, we have many things that can help you, I went to a less conventional doctor and showed him my blood work and said, what should I do? And he said, I should become a vegan. And he said, I think he said, you probably should become a vegan. And I said, you know, I write about food for a living. I'm a lifelong omnivore. This is not going to be easy for me. And he said, well, you're a smart guy. Figure something out. <laughs> so I wrote a bit, and I thought a bit, and I talked to people and read a lot. And, um, and I recognized the writing on the wall. And the writing on the wall is this. In the next generation, we're going to all be moving towards a more plant-based diet. Many of you have already done this. But everybody is going to do this. And whether we do it as a result of the economy, as a result of a health crisis, as a result of the collapse of agriculture, industrial agriculture as we know it, none of these things is impossible. We are going to do that. So the question is, what do we need to do? Really, what do we need to do? And the science is, in fact, very, very simple. This is what the science says. The science says, if you move away from the standard American diet, which, whose acronym is SAD, or SAD, and it is, if you move away from the standard American diet by substituting plants for almost anything else, unprocessed plants for hyper-processed foods, for added sugar, for junk foods, for animal products, if you substitute plants for those things, you will be healthier. That's what the science tells us. You may or may not live longer. You may or may not reduce your risks of certain diseases. You will be generally healthier. So that's the science. What I needed to do, and I was aware of this six years ago, what I needed to do was to figure out a strategy. I understand the science. These are things that are pretty much indisputable. What's my strategy for doing that? And what's a strategy that could be a lifelong strategy and could work? So I decided, in my sort of crazed wisdom, that I would become a semi-vegan. And there's no, there are vegans who will argue that being a little bit vegan is like being a little bit pregnant, but there's no better word, there's no better word than vegan for a diet composed of plants. So I decided to be a semi-vegan. I devised this, um, I devised this diet. And when I say diet here, I don't mean one of the 68,000 or whatever, is that the number, Joyce? This one, um, one of those 68,000 diet books. I mean a lifelong way of eating. What's a way that I can eat for the rest of my life that makes some sense to me, that I'm going to be able to stick with, and that might do me some good? So I devised this diet that a friend of mine jokingly then called VB6. The diet is 
I'm going to be a vegan until 6 o'clock, then I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. You know, Jesse, Jesse's right. If you even mildly swear before a crowd like this, you get a laugh, right? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> um, so the diet is this and, this, and it's a strategy. And I'll get to that word strategy in a second. The diet is this. I eat unprocessed fruits and vegetables, legumes, whole grains, blah, 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 from the time I wake up, which is usually pretty early, until dinner time. Then after dinner time, then at dinner time, I drink, I eat, I socialize, and so on. And my thought was this, because the question, there are two questions that are in half of your minds right now. One is, what about cream in my coffee? I'll get to that in a second. Two is, why dinner? I thought it was bad to have your biggest meal at night. Here's the thing. I wanted to do something that would actually have some staying power. If I say to you, I want you to have your biggest meal at breakfast, steak, eggs, couple glasses of red wine, <laughs> maybe some dessert, you're not going to have a real, and then I want you to be vegan after that. You're not going to have the most productive period of your life. If I say to you, let's be Europeans, although none of the Europeans, even the Spaniards don't do this anymore, none of the Europeans do this. Let's be Europeans, have a moderate breakfast, you know, piece of fruit, something like that, a cup of coffee. 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, we'll sit down, we'll have a cutting board filled with polenta like this, with sausages on top, tomato sauce, a huge loaf of bread, and a couple cooked vegetables and a salad, maybe a piece of fish, a few glasses of wine, nice coffee, three-hour nap, and then we'll go back to work at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and maybe have a salad before we go to bed. Somehow that doesn't sound, and I'm, I am not a chauvinist, that does not sound American to me. I don't think people are going to do that. But how about this? Oatmeal, fruit salad, a smoothie for breakfast, piece of fruit in the middle of the morning, a chopped salad, rice and beans, vegetable soup, whatever for lunch, a lot of snacking through the afternoon, but we're talking about apples, carrots, handfuls of nuts, whatever and then a dinner that allows you to chill with your family and friends, have those couple of glasses of wine, eat moderately, get ready for bed, do not sit in front of the television and eat a pint of ice cream and a bag of chips. Um, that sounds doable. And it is doable, has been doable for six years for me. A number of my friends have done this also. That's why I decided to write this book, by the way. It's not because I needed to write another book but because this seems to work. Because the strategy for applying the science, the science is eat more plants, this is a strategy for applying that science. You can come up with any strategy you like. I'm just telling you that this is one that's worked for me. And by the way, six years ago, seven years ago, I lost 35 pounds, my cholesterol went down 50 points, my blood sugar went back to normal, my sleep apnea went away, my wife said, hey, you stopped doing that weird snoring thing you were doing at night. Um, and actually, uh, my knees got better, but that's a function of losing weight. The milk and the coffee question. Here's the thing. There's a spectrum of eating. I have to check the time. OK, we're good. There's a spectrum of eating. On this end of the spectrum is the Morgan Spurlock Super Size Me diet. You all remember that. Brilliant, right? On this end of the spectrum, we don't exactly know what it is, but it's the ideal diet. Say it's a diet of 90% unprocessed fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and 10% really well-raised and well-produced animal products. That's probably the ideal diet. And if, that, and, and if that sounds like sort of a Mediterranean diet, it is sort of a Mediterranean diet. Guess what? None of us is at the ends of the spectrum. There's no one in this room, I guarantee you, doing the Morgan Spurlock diet. And I doubt there's anyone in this room eating the perfect diet either. We're all in here. Just like we're all in this room, we're all in this spectrum. Now, where are you on the spectrum? Because this is about your personal food policy. If you're just shy of old Morgan, 
The good news is that it's really easy for you to move to the, my left, this way. If you're over here, the good news is you probably don't have to do much of anything. If you're in here, it's probably where most of us are, the good news is improving your diet by 10%, 20%, 30% is doable, measurable by you without counting calories because you know when you're eating better and when you're not eating better, and sustainable. So again, if you say, all right, I kind of like this VB6 idea. Or, you know, I met a woman yesterday who said, well, me and my husband are vegan until the weekend because it's exactly the same reasoning. During the week, we're disciplined, we're working hard, we can do this, we get home, we have dinner together, we make it a vegan dinner, that's, that's what we do. And then on the weekend, we hang out with our friends, we're more loosey-goosey, we're less disciplined, we do whatever we want. I don't care what the strategy is. Most of us need rules, and that's why we need a strategy. So if you say, okay, I kind of like this idea, I'm gonna be vegan Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm gonna be vegan till six, I'm gonna be vegan weekdays, I'm gonna be vegan weekends. You pick a strategy, you pick something that likes, and you stick to it. And you don't stick to it dogmatically, you don't stick to it to the point where you beat yourself up if you let's say, fall off the wagon. It's not quite the same thing. You stick to it as best you can. Because as I said, if you improve your diet 10%, 30%, 70%, 90% over the course of the next one year, five years, 10 years, whatever, you've totally won. You've totally done a great thing for yourself. And you've also reduced your carbon footprint. You've done great things for the environment. You've done great things for the welfare of animals. You've done great things for farm workers. All of this is sort of true by improving your diet. Which means the short answer is, yeah, you can put cream in your coffee. Because <laughs> vegan before six doesn't mean being a nut. It, it means, well, it means eating nuts, sorry. Um, <laughs> It means having a strategy. And no one executes a strategy perfectly, not the most brilliant general of all time, not to relate it to our own lives, any of us in our exercise policy. We all say, or most of us say, I'm an exercise, and my plan is I'm going to run Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, swim Tuesday and Thursday, lift weights Saturday, or whatever your plan is. And you never quite get there even those of us who are fairly dedicated amateur athletes fail all the time. Things happen. You have a doctor's appointment, you're on the road, whatever. Doesn't mean that you don't have an exercise policy. It just means you're not executing it perfectly. You had a bad week, you intended to exercise four times, you exercised twice. Doesn't mean next week you say, all right, I'm only exercising twice, that's my new policy. You try to do four times again. And food is exactly the same thing. So to the question, is there hope? I want to say three, quickly, three little things. On a national level, when we talk about defining food, when we talk about regulation, education, and transparency, we have big, big problems because if you think that Barack Obama is a well-intentioned man, and a well-intentioned man is President of the United States, and he can't get a whole hell of a lot done, then what are we going to get done on a national level? On a local level, though, we can get a lot done. We can change school lunches. We can work on getting schools to make sure that there's no junk food, vending machines, et cetera, in their schools. We can limit the impact junk food companies have on school uh, athletic funding. We could do all kinds of things. We can think about uh, soda taxes or big, ban big gulp bans as we did in New York, as we thought about in New York. Um, we can do plenty on a local level. But on a personal level, there's a huge amount of hope because you can do everything that I've talked about starting today you can do everything that I've talked about. And you don't have to do it perfectly. You just have to do it with good intent and consistently. So um, 
I probably have never sounded more like a preacher in my life, but I'm going to say there is hope for all of us. So thank you very much.